from St. Paul's Epistle to the Ephesians, chapter 5, beginning with the 25th verse. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. Now, Father, we come to you in this devotion, and we pray that the words that I speak and the words that everyone hears through these various platforms might be in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, a very warm welcome to you all today from uh, the freest city on earth, New York City. <laughs> Anyway, my name is Jacob Smith, and I'm the rector of Calvary St. George's, and I am thrilled to be back with all of you at the 1517 conference. Even if it's socially distanced here, I'm going to pretend that I'm in La Jolla. And it's not working, but anyway, we'll, we'll do what we can. I look forward to being with you all next year as well. But it's been difficult uh, for me to think about the concept of freedom uh, this year when our lives have felt anything but free. Mask on. Don't touch this. Don't touch that. Stay off the beaches. The other day I woke up a little late and got started in, uh, a little late and I went to my favorite coffee shop around the corner and um, uh, I ordered my coffee and I did what a lot of New Yorkers do here. You know, it was piping hot and I kind of went over to slip and take off my mask to take a quick sip. And all of a sudden from across the counter, this barista screams at me, Sir, put your mask back on or get out of the shop. And I, you know, I was so embarrassed. I put my mask on and uh, the fact that a blue haired 22 year old barista could yell at me like that in public well, it reminded me, Jacob, you're not all that free. <laughs> the idea of freedom from a human perspective is a difficult topic in theology because freedom from a human perspective alone quickly becomes slavery. It becomes tyranny. It becomes addiction. It becomes depression. Freedom from a human perspective alone becomes overbearing forms of safety. This is my first point. Freedom, from an existential perspective, on human terms alone, is a myth. Freedom, from our perspective, is a reality that is elusive and is ultimately, ultimately it ends up like that 1991 feminist drama. I knew this would be a huge hit here. Thelma and Louise. Human freedom from our perspective winds up in a car crash at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. However, the Bible teaches us something different. The Bible teaches, and indeed most of the early church fathers and all of the Protestant reformers agreed that God is the only absolute sovereign, the only one who is truly, truly free. Freedom from a Christian perspective, contrary to the way it has been co-opted by the American state religion, which preaches autonomy and free will, freedom, according to the Bible, says that if it exists at all, freedom is mediated and dependent upon the presence of another. Human freedom is ultimately a gift, and it comes with a name. Jesus Christ the righteous, who is our only mediator and advocate. And this is my second point. Human freedom, in the truest sense, is the freedom of a Christian. Because it is a freedom which is given as all gift by our Lord, who is the only one who is truly free. And this gift frees us from death itself, and this gift ultimately leads to new and eternal life. But the question is, how? In the here and now, how is that possible? Well, in his work, The Freedom of a Christian, Luther describes how we are given this marvelous gift of freedom. 
We are given this marvelous gift of freedom by faith alone. Because first, the gift of faith unites us to Christ, rendering the law and our works unnecessary for any sort of salvation. Second, faith enables us to take God at his word and declares that God is trustworthy and true in justifying the ungodly apart from any works. And then third, like a bride to a bridegroom, faith unites us with Christ and says that all that is his is mine, which is righteousness and life, and all that is mine is now his, sin and death. I remember early on in my ministry um, foolishly asking Stephen Paulson at the second Mockingbird Conference in New York City, I said, you know, Dr. Paulson, as a man, <laughs> I have a real hard time relating to the image of being Christ's bride. Do you have any other illustrations? To which he looked at me and he responded, it doesn't matter if you can relate to the image or not. When our Lord calls you his bride, you shave your legs and put on some lipstick. And that is why I'm still in the Episcopal Church today. <laughs> However, the bride and the bridegroom analogy has begun to make a lot more sense to me as I've done weddings. One in particular sticks out to me. Early on in my ministry, we had this amazing cellist play at our church on Sundays named Jackson. We called him Jack. And what was amazing about him was that he could not only play St. John's Passion, but he believed it. However, what made him really rare was that not only was he a Christian, but he came from one of the oldest, waspiest, and wealthiest families in the Mid-Atlantic. Well, one Sunday after church, he came up to me and said, Jake, I'd like to introduce you to the most wonderful woman in the world. And we'd like to get married here. And he asked if I would preside over the service. Now, in my mind, I thought I was going to meet a very polite waspy gal named Scarlet, Serena, possibly Blythe, you know, and she would come up to me wearing a pink shirt with some sort of animal embroidered on it, and she might have belonged to St. James Uptown. But instead, I meet this little woman from Central America named Tilly. And Tilly said hello, and it caught me off guard. I was like, wow, so nice to meet you. And then I said, how long have you been dating? To which they responded, nine months. And I was like, that's interesting. Tilly, how come I've never met you before? To which she replied, uh, Reverend, I love your sermons, but me and my family are active members of the Pentecostal Church of the New Jerusalem in the South Bronx. I was like, whoa, this is going to be interesting. Two different worlds coming to collide. And then I asked, well, how did you meet? To which Jack said, I saw her on the subway, and I thought this girl was so beautiful, I just had to ask her out. So I asked her on the subway, and she said, yes, and here we are. And I looked at her, and she blushed, and she said, can you, can you believe I said yes to that crazy white guy on the subway? And we all kind of laughed. It was beautiful. And then they went on to tell me that they had discerned after a lot of prayer and fasting that they were called to get married. It wasn't very romantic, but it was very Pentecostal, and the love that these two had for each other just oozed Christian freedom. The righteousness that comes not through class or club etiquette or the ability to dance a cumbia, but the righteousness that comes through faith, a righteousness that was enabling this love to thrive. And she had received, it was beautiful, she received a blessing from her church and her father to attend Calvary. And we started premarital counseling. And things were going amazing until Jack's mother started meddling in the relationship. And the meddling got so bad that poor Tilly was at her wit's end. The freedom of this relationship was being tamped down by the law of WASP 
which can grind, if you've ever experienced it, it can grind a person down with all of the unspoken rules and yet feigned niceties. So I exercised freedom and did something I'd never done before or again. I sat down with Jack's parents and we made our way through all the small talk to get at the real issue. Essentially, it was that Jack had a massive trust and they wanted a prenup in the marriage. They wanted to insert the law into this freedom to which both Jack and Tilly refused to sign. Jack's mother literally said to me in my office, do you realize, Reverend, if this marriage goes through as is, this woman will have access to all of Jack's trust? And I looked at her and said, yes, indeed. And that is a great cost. But in exchange, you will get an amazing daughter who truly loves your son. I'm here to tell you that Jack and Tilly held firm to this gift. They held firm to their freedom. And we had an amazing Book of Common Prayer wedding service, complete with a Pentecostal prayer circle led by her father that was louder than the organ and went longer than our liturgy itself. Praise the Lord. And guess what? Tilly got access to all of Jack's money. And Jack's family got access to the joys of not only having now a Central American daughter, but a Central American extended family who make the best plantain tamales in all the South Bronx. Like a bride to a bridegroom, Faith unites us with Christ and says, all that is his is mine, righteousness and life, and all that is mine is his, sin and death. And this is my third point, and it's good news for all of us this year in 2020, and it's good news for all of us every year. Thank God, like Tilly and Jack, our Lord Jesus Christ, doesn't believe in prenumps. Amen.